Howdy folks, this is Cowboy V2. Thanks for joining today. So you've clicked this video to see what's the deal with the thermal image and how it relates to growing citrus in cooler climates. Let's get into that. In this video, I'll go over what's the environment like here at the ranch, what I'm trying to grow, what I've tried in the past, what has worked and did not work, and finally, what's the deal with this tree and how this building and chickens of all things made it a success. We are located in the Western United States in USDA Zone 8B. Okay, so take that with a grain of salt. The reality is that when trying to grow things on the edge of suitability for a particular zone, the finer details of topography and super specific site characteristics come heavily into play. More specifically, our orchard is located at 2,200 feet of elevation. That's 670 meters for my friends outside the US. The ecological environment is considered oak woodland Basically, that means hot, dry summers with mild winters and rolling topography populated with oak trees, bull pine, and other low elevation vegetation. We get nearly all of our rainfall in winter and spring with rarely a shower in the summer. Sounds like the perfect environment for citrus, right? The reality though, is that at 2,200 feet of elevation, we consistently get hard freezes each winter with some snow most years. I could easily enough grow container citrus, but the older I get, the more I appreciate ease of maintenance. Grow a tree right, and it'll just grow and be happy. Key is to find out just what right is. Now on to what I'm growing here. Our ranch was first homestead in 1875. The proprietors were listed as orchardists as early as 1898, and I've even seen aerial photos of a remnant orchard from 1948. When we bought the ranch, the orchard was all but taken back by nature, with just an acre or so left, having few producing trees remaining, mostly barlet pear. When we initially started bringing the orchard back to life, we had to decide what our long-term goal was. We weren't interested in producing fruit commercially and wanted to reduce the maintenance input to a manageable casual level. I'd envisioned walking through the orchard in the fall with the smell of fermenting fruit on the ground and sunlight dappling through the road overhead canopy, sampling many different varieties as I went. What this meant is that we needed to keep it relatively small, but were free to experiment with all sorts of different varieties of trees, even those that were unlikely to take. In that first year, we removed literally 50 pine trees from the small section of orchard by the house and planted all sorts of fruit. Apples, plums, and cherries were standard, but we also tried meldar, pawpaw, quince, and so on. We also planted many varieties of avocado and of course citrus. Okay, so what worked and what did not? As a reminder, our goal was low maintenance. This eliminated the use of sprays, covers in the winter, and bird netting in summer. Apples seemed to grow most places, and we found the same to be true for us. Pears, cherries, and plums also do really well for us. Same with meldar, quince, almond, walnut, and filbert nut. We also have olive, loquat, jujubes, and figs. What's not so great? Peaches and nectarines grow well here, but get really bad curls, so those are out. Avocados got hit by nearly every freeze except one tree. There's a video of that one that I'll put a link in the description for. I've tried many different varieties of citrus and have discovered something somewhat unexpected. How much site-specific placement can affect success? For most of the citrus that have not survived, it was due to freeze damage. I've tried all different types of orange, lemon, grapefruit, etc. The one that stuck though, well actually two, were an Owari Satsuma Mandarin Orange, basically what they call little cuties in the supermarket, and Nagami Kumquat. Before we get much further in, if you'd like to see more of these videos, please subscribe and also don't forget to hit the like button. I'll be putting out a lot more interesting content like this on outdoor power equipment and other topics related to living out in the country. So what is the difference about these two? More specifically, where did I put them that was different? You can see the taller one here. That's the Mandarin Orange. It's located on the east downslope side of this old brick building that our chickens call home. The tree is planted about three or four feet away from the building. What I had suspected when I planted it here is that the building would heat up during the day and store energy in the mass of those thick brick walls. During the night, the walls would radiate that heat energy, reducing the chill effect of particularly cold nights. When it freezes here, it rarely drops below 20 Fahrenheit. That's 7C, but that's proven too cold for all of my exposed citrus, even of this same variety. I wanted to show proof of this effect by using a thermal imaging camera that I picked up a few years back. This is a FLIR handheld unit. 
It displays hotter areas with lighter colors, white and yellow, and cooler areas using blue and black. It also shows the center screen target temperature in the upper left hand corner. Okay, so here you can see the chicken coop at night through the thermal camera. This video is taken around 10 p.m. at night. Notice how the walls are much warmer than the surrounding area. The ground is shown in the mid 40s, Fahrenheit that is, and the walls are as warm as 72 Fahrenheit, almost 30 degrees warmer than the lowest temperature. Something else to note though, look through the screen window of the coop. It appears to be as warm or even warmer than the surrounding walls. That's something else I didn't expect. I believe that this is caused by a combination of factors. The interior of the coop will tend to radiate just as much energy as the exterior, but will cool slower than the exterior because the air is partially trapped. Additionally, we've got these little thermal generation units inside that convert bugs and grain into eggs and heat energy. Imagine that. Take a look at the light spots on the camera. Those are all chickens. You can fact check me on this one. Chickens will tend to produce about 10 watts each. Think about that for a minute. Each chicken gives off about as much heat as a 10 watt incandescent light bulb. There are about 20 chickens there, so they are generating around 200 watts of heat energy. That's a lot. 200 watts of heat energy flowing out the window all winter long in addition to what the walls radiate. That's pretty wild, huh? So in a marginal environment for this type of tree, we've got this great passive heat source. No need to cover up the tree or hang Christmas lights on it. There's one other factor that plays an important role here though. This is something that I figure helped with the survival of our Joey avocado tree. That is, that this tree is located on the downhill side of the coop. Okay, so here's how that works. Cool air tends to flow like water downhill. When it encounters an obstacle, it will either pile up behind it or flow around it. As cool air flows down the hill through the orchard, it flows around the back of the chicken coop and to some degree, it will pass the low side without concentrating or dwelling there. This tree is located in a sheltered location on the low side of the coop with a heat source only three feet away. This is one of the best scenarios possible. I also think it would be cool to try this concept out further, possibly with thermal mass being a rock face, a water tank, or something else even. Let me know in the comments if you've ever applied location selection like this or have ever observed related phenomena. Okay, well that's it for today. If you haven't already, please subscribe and hit the like button. Until next time, thanks for watching.